Uh, so my lab is focused on nanomaterials preparation synthesis characterization, specifically quantum dots, which I'll talk about mostly today, and also their use in biology as fluorescent probes. And so I hope today you'll come away with a pretty good understanding of the physics of these materials, how they work, how we can engineer them, why we want to engineer them, how, and why they're not just another fluorescent dye you can use, like a fluorescent protein or fluorescent um, organic dye, and how they distinguish themselves from that, and how you potentially could use them for your own research. So what are quantum dots? Uh, they, are, they are nearly spherical nanocrystals made out of semiconductor materials. And so the structure of them, uh, that we're, the ones that we're interested in, are crystalline materials. And so they are generally on the order of 2 to 10 nanometers diameter. And they can be prepared in multiple ways. You can have them prepared as a colloidal material, in which it's a solid state material dispersed in another, uh, another phase, like in solution. So these are the type we're most interested in, because a colloidal nanomaterial could potentially be dispersed into a cell, into a cellular medium, or biological uh, solution. And so it could interface with uh, whatever biomedical application that you're interested in looking at. They can also be deposited directly through synthesis on to a crystalline substrate. Uh, these are known as epitaxial quantum dots. And so they're grown on wafers directly as, uh, as semi-crystalline materials on top of another crystal. Uh, you can see through TEMs that they are crystalline materials. The most common motifs and structures that we see today uh, for use in biomedicine uh, is this multi-component structure in which the core is a material called cadmium selenide. It's a semiconductor with a band gap of about 1.8. And on top of that, you have another crystalline shell grown around it. That's usually zinc sulfide. That provides an insulating barrier so that the quantum dots have bright fluorescence in water. And then you usually have some kind of organic coating on top of that second coating. And that stabilizes the particles in whatever dispersion media you're looking at. So if it's in water, this would be some kind of hydrophilic polymer or hydrophilic ligand. And on top of that, you can decorate these with a variety of different functional ligands. Or you can uh, modify them chemically to have neutral surfaces, which is what polyethylene glycol is usually used for. Or you could put functionality on surfaces, like streptavidin or antibodies, to give them a, spe a specific um, uh, attachment point to biological um, media. So they're interesting to us in terms of bioengineering applications, because they're very versatile in their fluorescence uh, capabilities. You can image them. Uh, at macroscopic levels, like in an animal, down to the cellular level, and also the single molecule level. Uh, so basically, they can be imaged in any capacity that you'd take in a conventional quantum, uh, conventional fluor for, like an organic dye or a fluorescent protein. However, what makes them distinguishable from those is that they can also be used for electron micro microscopy contrast. So if you have quantum dots in a cell and you slice up the cell, make really thin layers, and then you put it under ele electron microscope, you can actually see them with your eye or through the uh, through the electron. Uh, contrast, uh, as opposed to organic dyes and fluorescent proteins, which are not very opaque in uh, electron microscopy. Uh, but further than that, their optical properties are, have some outstanding attributes that make them very useful for certain applications in biomedicine. First of all, their fluorescence and size tunable. If you look at this uh, spectrum of five different sizes of quantum bots made out of the exact same material, from 1.8 nanometers up to 7.3 nanometers, they all have different fluorescent wavelengths depending on the size alone. And so if anybody's ever tried to make a fluorescent dye a different color or a fluorescent protein a different color, it's non-trivial. It's not a lot of intuition can go into that. It's a lot of uh, guesswork. And you don't really know intuitively how to change the, the fluorescent wavelengths of this traditional organic dyes and proteins. But quantum dots, you just change the size. You let your reaction grow, go to for, for longer periods of time in order to allow larger particles to be available in solution, and then you get longer wavelengths of light emission. In addition, they can have very uh, efficient near-infrared emission. Near-infrared emission is very useful for biological applications because you have better depth penetration through tissue, and you have lower autofluorescence. So you have a higher signal-to-noise ratio, and you can see deeper into tissue. In addition, they are easily multiplexed. So multiplexing means looking at multiple analytes simultaneously in the same sample using different channels. And you can see these capabilities by looking at their spectra. So these blue curves are absorption or excitation spectra, and these red curves are fluorescence emission spectra. So you can see for a quantum dot, the blue uh, absorption spectrum 
increases substantially when you move away from the emission spectrum as opposed to fluorescent dyes and organic proteins in which the maximum excitation value you can have is very close to the emission value. And that means you lose some of your emission value when you're detecting it because it overlaps with the excitation. And also, you need to have multiple lasers or multiple light sources exciting multiple colors. Whereas with a quantum dot, you can excite all these particles of different colors at a specific single wavelength of short uh, excitation. Uh, so these two are exceptionally great attributes for in vivo imaging. near infrared emission for deep penetration through tissue. And melt deflexing capabilities are great because you can look at multiple dyes, multiple analytes simultaneously in biological media. Uh, for single molecule imaging applications, these two other attributes come into play. They have very large extinction coefficients, typically 10 to 100 times larger than those of organic dyes and proteins. And assuming that you have the same quantum yield or efficiency of your fluorescence after absorption, then that translates to a roughly 10 to 100 times greater emission intensity than a fluorescent dye and a protein. Uh, in addition, they are extremely photostable. You can image them for minutes to up to uh, sometimes hours at the single molecule level without photo bleaching, as opposed to organic dyes and proteins in which you usually have just a few seconds of uh, observation before they uh, oxidize and decay. Uh, so you can always stabilize some particles uh, and some fluorescent dyes in solution that's outside of cells. But inside cells, the photostability and the excitation coefficients are what really give these great attributes for imaging uh, at the single molecule level. They can also be prepared with a variety of sizes and shapes. Uh, and so there's two major disadvantages for use of quantum dots in vivo and in biomedical applications. First of all, they're hydrodynamically large. Uh, this is a rough schematic uh, showing the sizes of an organic dye, fluorescent protein, and a conventional quantum dot, and about an order of magnitude larger. So for applications that requires minimum steric hindrance, a maximum ability to diffuse in porous media, they might not be the ideal material to use. Uh, in addition, they're inefficient energy acceptors. So for FRET applications, they can be used efficiently as donors, but not so much as acceptors. So we can engineer these attributes, and this is part of what we do in our lab, is to try to make them uh, more ideal for these applications. So I'm going to go into uh, the physics and engineering of these particles for the first part of this talk. And then I'll go into the applications later on uh, to give you a brief background about how the fluorescence emission works from quantum dots. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of insight into uh, how material science views solid state materials. Uh, so you can separate out different types of solid state materials based on their energy gap, which is the energy separating the highest uh, occupied molecular orbitals from the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. And so in solid state materials, if there is a substantial amount of covalent bonding in a crystalline material, then you have a lot of electronic sharing between atoms in the material. And that causes these bands to rise of continuous energy states. In an insulator, the energy difference between the valence band, the HOMO level, and the conduction band, the LUMO level, is very large. In a conductor, they basically overlap. And so what that means is that if you put a conductor in an electric field, uh, electrons will be free to mobilize because they can get out of the valence band into this conduction band. Uh, whereas in an insulator, this does not happen at room temperature. In semiconductors, the energy gap is in an in intermediate level in which you can tune the capacity to have conduction and um, it can also tune their optical properties. And so uh, what's interesting about semiconductors is that their band gap is at a certain, certain energy level at which optical phenomena take place within the visible range and near infrared range. And so if you uh, shine a light of energy in which the photon energy is greater than that of the band gap on a semiconductor, then you have an electron in the valence band becoming excited to the conduction band. These are the charge carriers in a semiconductor. And so if you put this semiconductor in an electric field, the negative charge would go toward the positive pole, and the positive charge would go toward the negative pole. This is called the electron. This is called the hole. And these rapidly decay down to the band edges, just through dissipation of heat. And in the, the final process of uh, absorption and emission, the electron and the hole recombine in, to release if it's a certain type of material called a direct band gap material, it'll 
in this photo decay process, it'll emit a, uh, a photon of energy equal to the band gap. So that's in a solid state material as a bulk material, like a large sheet of semiconductor or a large, a large crystal. So what happens when you move from a bulk crystal down to a small crystal? Um, so in the bulk crystal, this electron in the hole, they actually form a particle. They're, they're oppositely charged, and so they're attracted to each other. And just like a hydrogen atom, they form what's called an exciton, which is a quasi-stabilized uh, dual particle system. And this has a specific diameter depending on the material properties of the bulk material. So when you cut this material down and make it smaller and smaller and smaller, and it becomes similar in size to the exciton, these two charges are necessarily closer together. This causes the entire energy of the system to increase. That causes the band gap to increase effectively. So in order to annihilate this system, the, the exciton requires greater energy. That's the origin of the, um, of the size dependence of the optical properties. And at the same time, as these crystals get smaller and smaller, you get more discrete electronic energy bands that arise. That's because it's becoming more like a molecule or an atom. There's less sharing of the electrons between the atoms in the crystal. So you can see in this spectrum that uh, materials that are basically not confined, like a cadmium selenide material, which is very large, has a pretty uh, uh, amorphous shape to its absorption spectrum. As you make this nanocrystal crystal smaller and smaller and smaller, beyond that, smaller than that of the Borg cyclone, you see these discrete electronic transitions occurring. In addition, the band gap, or the energy of the lowest excited state transition, increases. Likewise, the fluorescence emission can be tuned to higher energies, which corresponds to lower wavelengths. So this is called the quantum confinement effect, the capacity to alter the optical properties, specifically the band gap, um, depending on the size of the, of the material in reference to the Bohr cyclone. At the same time, you can have mixed degrees of confinement in the same material. So a quantum dot has confinement of the exciton in all three dimensions, whereas a rod is only confined in the lateral dimensions of the rod. And elongated along the axis, it might have a dimension that's not confined. And at the same time, a platelet or a well-like structure is only confined in one dimension. And in two lateral dimensions around the platelet, it is, does not experience confinement. So what is this? Um, size-dependent tuning mean for us for when we're trying to use these as biological imaging agents? First of all, changing the size allows us to change the wavelength of fluorescence emission, which is great because we can make different colors. We could tag them for different antibodies, and we could look at different uh, molecules, specifically in cells, at the exact same time. However, they have different sizes and brightnesses per particle, and that's disadvantageous for quantitative imaging because each particle is going to behave differently because of its size, it'll have a different diffusion coefficient, and it'll have a different brightness. And therefore, it's, uh, the detected fluorescence will not correspond directly to the concentration of the analyte in solution. So with conventional size tunable quantum dots, your extinction coefficient, which is your uh, efficiency of absorption or excitation, is directly proportional to the volume of the nanocrystal. And so this is a normalized excitation spectrum of three different sizes of nanocrystals prepared out of cadmium selenide. And what you can see that is that at high energies, where you might be exciting these quantum dots, there can be up to a 20-fold difference in excitation efficiency. So if we take these fluorescent spectra, which assuming that they all have the exact same quantum yield, they typically do in water somewhere between 60 to 80%, and we mix them one to one, the spectrum that you get out is very low in terms of the intensity of the smallest particles compared to large particles. And this translates down to the, small, uh, to the single molecule level. You can see in these fluorescence <coughs> micrographs that under the same imaging conditions, you can see individual red quantum dots, which are much larger than the blue quantum dots, which are almost invisible under these conditions. So this is especially worse, or uh, a poor quality for imaging in conditions in which you have a large amount of autofluorescent background. So if you take cells and you want to look at four different analytes simultaneously using antibody conjugated quantum dots, and you take just cells in, in suspension and you use quantum dots as molecular imaging agents for them, you can get discrete spectra out 
and their spectra won't directly correspond to their concentration, but you can normalize that usually by just knowing the, the relative brightnesses of each particle compared to, um, compared to each other. But when you then move into complex tissue, like in paraffin embedded tissue specimens, which have a huge amount of autofluorescent background, this background is mostly in the blue to green range. You wash out your signal from these blue quantum dots. And the blue quantum dots are the dimmest in the first place. And so you have this exacerbated effect where you can almost not even see your blue and green signals, but you can see the red ones preferentially. So we want to get around this. And so the way we engineer these particles is to try to get away from the size-based normalization. And an alternative to this is to use alloyed materials. Alloyed materials we could potentially make out of what would be normally a binary cadmium selenide material, then alloy it with a secondary material, which forms a ternary alloy. And in this case, the example is cadmium zinc selenide. And this allows us to have all sizes are the same in the quantum dot, but different fluorescence emission depending on the material alone. So this can actually get us so that instead of differences in absorption and brightness corresponding to usually 15 to 20 uh, fold differences, we can get two to, two to three fold differences for these materials. We can further normalize these with a new material that we've developed called a ternary alloy quantum well, in which we basically take out the center of these particles and we only have one dimensional confinement. Uh, these are fantastic, however, they have to be very large. You have to have a core, which is at least typically four nanometers in diameter. The shell is another two nanometers, and then another insulating shell on top of that makes these very large. And for purposes I'll talk about later, we're trying to make these as small as possible. So currently we're focusing on these ternary alloy quantum dots. A uh, problem though is that when you synthesize quantum dots, it's hard enough to make these monodisperse in the first place. Uh, if you add in a, a third material of cadmium, zinc, and selenium, and try to make them all at once, you add another level of inhomogeneity of composition between different particles in your solution, as well as the size. So what we've developed is a way to take homogeneous binary nanoparticles and then homogeneously alloy them in a second step. And so this is based on a principle of, of cation exchange, which is receiving a lot of attention in uh, the recent literature uh, for a variety of uh, applications in nanomedicine and for nanocrystal material engineering. The basic principle is this, you take your initial quantum dot, which here would be cadmium telluride, and we just mix it with a mercury precursor. Uh, cadmium telluride and mercury telluride have nearly the same lattice constant, which enables these uh, cations to free flowly, uh, flow freely between, uh, within the lattice itself. And so you can actually directly exchange the cadmium ions for mercury ions. And as you can see, uh, based on these electron micrographs of cadmium telluride before and after mercury cation exchange, uh, as well as the histograms of di diameters before and after, they don't change substantially uh, after cation exchange. However, because cadmium telluride and mercury telluride have a large difference in their bulk band gaps, uh, both roughly 1.5 electron volts for cadmium telluride and a near zero band gap for mercury telluride, um, you decrease the band gap substantially when you add mercury to these particles. And so if you take quantum dots with an absorption spectrum in blue here, made out of cadmium telluride, and a fluorescent spectrum here, just by adding mercury in, in a homogeneous way, you can shift the uh, optical properties toward the red spectrum and not change the size at all. So we have independent control over the band gap and the size now. And in addition, by looking at the absorption spectra of these particles, we only have a two to three fold difference in brightness. So we became interested in this, uh, in this phenomenon of cation exchange. Uh, if you look at this schematic that I have drawn here, uh, I have shown that mercury basically displaces cadmium randomly within this lattice. But we actually don't know if that happens. These are very, very hard to characterize at this level of this sub nanometer level. We don't know what the structure might be based on electron microscopy alone because the lattice matches are identical. And X-ray diffraction tells us absolutely nothing because uh, they're, they have the exact same uh, lattice, um, basically lattice parameters in, in bulk as they do in nanocrystalline form. So we can tell a lot from the optical absorption spectra of these particles. 
So if you look at the optical absorption spectrum of quantum dots, they have these very discrete peaks. And they actually correspond to specific transitions within the nanocrystal. So if you imagine molecular uh, orbitals within just a, a simple uh, molecule like hydrogen, they have uh, very specific electronic states, like S states, P states. And that's the same as a whole quantum dot. So it's just an order of magnitude larger in scale. And so we can actually use um, uh, the Schrodinger wave equation to solve these electronic energy states as the same way we can with quantum mechanics in single molecules. And so we know from these models that these specific transitions uh, correspond to certain energy states within the nanocrystal. And by tracking how these change dynamically with increasing mercury content, we can then infer based on the energy of these transitions as well as their intensity what the structure might be. And so we modeled these nanocrystals, cadmium telluride, merc mercury telluride alloys, as either a homogeneous alloy, or as a core shell alloy, or as a gradient core shell alloy. And what we saw was that using the, an effective mass approximation, which you basically are saying that the, the, the bulk material properties of these materials is going to be the same at the nanometer scale level as they are at the bulk level. Uh, we solved the Schrodinger wave equation for these, and we saw that the intensity of the, these two electronic transitions should not change if these are homogeneous alloys. This dotted line shows the oscillator strength. This is basically the intensity of these peaks and how they should change with increasing mercury content. They should not change if they're alloys. However, the second exciton, this second peak here, should increase substantially in intensity. And this is what we see if these are core shells. So we have good reason to believe that these materials are actually core shell materials, but they probably have some level of, uh, of a gradient core shell structure. But they're not homogeneous in their structure. So that's, this is enables us to make brightness and size equalize quantum dots. But still there's the problem that quantum dots are much larger than organic dyes and fluorescent proteins, which have been found to be so useful in biomedicine. So we also want to explore how to make these as small as possible. Quantum dots that you buy commercially from Invitrogen and uh, NN Labs and other commercial sources, they generally have a structure that's somewhat like this. They've got a fairly large core surrounded by a thick polymeric shell uh, with uh, randomly decorated um, bioaffinity ligands. This whole thing, the hydrodynamic size, how it behaves in water, is roughly 20 to 35 nanometers in diameter. That's much larger than what is ideal. Uh, you can see in this video that shows three different sizes of quantum dots diffusing in uh, the cytosol of a cell that large particles like ones that are conventional quantum dots are almost immobile when they're in the cytoplasm of the cell. That's basically because the cytoplasm functions as a sieve with a cutoff size of somewhere between 10 to 15 nanometers. And uh, the cytoskeleton and macromolecules prevent a large amount of uh, diffusion within the cytoplasm. Uh, smaller particles, like 10 nanometer ones, you can see in certain regions of the cell are very diffusive and they move quickly compared to uh, larger particles. So this gives us reason to believe that minimizing the size of these particles will maximize their, uh, their utility for live cell imaging and for other applications in, in porous medium. So for bioassays, we also want to have the smallest particles possible to minimize um, steric hindrance and to maximize the fusion rate and, and to maximize the, uh, the speed of your analysis. And for live cell imaging, there's also a specific cutoff size in, of, the, of nuclear pores of roughly three nanometers of diameter. So if we can get them even smaller than that, we could potentially access the nucleus uh, as well as the cytoplasm. For animal imaging, there's a specific threshold for renal filtration. So if we want to have quantum dots injected into somebody's bloodstream and have it filtered out entirely through the kidneys, we have to make them smaller than 10 nanometers. And also, we have improved pen penetration into tumors and other types of disease states if we can minimize the size particle as well. So, so we have been that, that over the next several years, we're trying to move from this large bulky structure to this compact and precise nanometer scale structure, which is more similar to fluorescent proteins. Uh, but how do we do this? Smaller quantum dots have worse optical properties. One of the reasons they're so great is because it's so bright, but the brightness is strongly dependent on the size. So uh, 
Smaller particles have lower extinction and decreased brightness. In addition, smaller particles emit in the blue to green range. And so that's a disadvantage because they have uh, more overlap with autofluorescence of cells and they have, be they have less penetration depth for tissue. Uh, so we can solve both of these by moving our fluorescence to the near infrared. And so this whole window in the near infrared, which is almost never used in biology for fluorescence imaging at the single molecule level at high sensitivity, because we don't have dyes and fluorescent proteins that can emit efficiently in that range. But we can make quantum dots do that. So we can kind of solve these by just moving everything into near infrared. This third issue is a decreased, decreased stability toward photooxidation. The smaller particle you have, the more of the atoms reside on the surface and the more curvature you have to the surface. And that causes a higher surface energy of the particles. And that makes them more reactive. And almost all semiconductors can be prone to photooxidation when they're being excited. And so minimizing the size also makes them less stable. And so that basically negates the utility of these particles for single molecule imaging. So what we can do is try to just maximize this stability chemically rather than through size. And so the previous results I showed were for cadmium telluride based materials. They work really, really well for a lot of applications. But they're also prone to oxidation. This is a, a frost diagram that shows the relative uh, stability, thermodynamic stabilities of different elements in different oxidation states. And so these are chalcogenides or chalcogens. These all are in within the same column of the periodic table. And we can make cadmium based materials out of all three of these. You can see that tellurium, which has this uh, high, uh, uh, or it has actually a low stability on the oxidation scale for tellurides, the negative two oxidation state. These are the least stable in a, in a cadmium based semiconductor. Whereas a sulfur is the most stable. And so it'd be an advantage to be able to just replace tellurium in these structures with either sulfur or selenium. Uh, we worked on sulfur for a long time, but we can never get the cation exchange process to occur with great control. But we can do this with selenium. And so all of our materials now that we work on for single molecule imaging and imaging in animals are based on these mercury cadmium selenide materials. They are a uh, kind of an intermediate in stability and an intermediate in tunability. And they allow us to uh, have a large spectral range available to us with very great stability and small size. And so you can see when we make cadmium selenide or alloy with mercury and then cap it, we can shift the band gaps homogeneously into the near infrared. We can get multiple colors that span the visible to the near infrared range. And also, these can all be compact in size. And so all these have the exact same size. We can make them as small as about 3.5 nanometers. And their stability at the single molecule level uh, can be extended into the tens of minutes range. And they can readily be seen with conventional epifluorescence microscopy. And so these are quantum dots, just non-specifically absorbed onto a slide. You can easily see them blinking, which is an optical phenomenon due to ionization of the particles, which is indicative of single molecules. And they can readily be seen at video rate microscopy, which is about 30 frames per second. Uh, but at the same time, this is only the core. We I discussed earlier that the shell of these materials also contributes to the size. And so several years ago, we, we engineered the shells of these materials to move from what was a conventional bilayer structure in which you have uh, a micelle-like structure. So the quantum dot is initially made in a uh, hydrophobic medium. And they are coated with alkane chains. And they need to be dispersed in water somehow. And we usually do this by either replacing these ligands uh, or by coating with a amphiphilic polymer. And so the amphiphilic polymer is the most traditional method because this structure is extremely stable. However, it's bulky. And so we basically just fuse these together. We, instead of having a bilayer structure, we made a monolayer structure in which we have multi-dentate ligand binding between a polymer, which has been modified to be specific, to have specific attachment points to metal ions on the surface using amines and thiols. And then we can stabilize the structure in colloidal suspension by having a hydrophilic moiety, which in this case is a carboxylic acid. And so you can see, just by replacing this polymer alone on similar sized quantum dots, uh, this is a, uh, a gel permeation chromatography experiment in which we took four different sizes of quantum dot cores between two to six nanometers in diameter uh, with the multidentate polymer ligand. These particles ended up being roughly six to 10 nanometers in diameter 
compared to the ones coated with a conventional amphiphilic polymer, which is based on the exact same backbone. It just has hydrophobic moieties on it. Uh, it roughly cuts the particle size in half. So you'd be directly comparing this 18 nanometer particle to this 10, nan 10 nanometer particle, uh, which the hydrophilic portion and coating portion contributes uh, almost twice the hydrodynamic diameter between the two different uh, mechanisms. So the next part of the talk, I'll discuss what we do with these particles for single molecule imaging and imaging in living tissue. Uh, so when you put quantum bots on cells, these everything I'll be showing from here on are based on the cadmium mercury selenide based quantum dots. You can easily see that when you focus in on cells with turf microscopy, replicate microscopy, we can visualize at video rate the diffusion of these particles in solution. And so if they are given some kind of specific fun functionality, like a, a ligand coating or an antibody coating, you can see effectively what that specific ligand is doing at the molecular level. And this enables you to do long-term imaging, tens of minutes, and video rate microscopy. Uh, you're really limited effectively by uh, how much intense, how light uh, can be absorbed by the cell. And so if you can absorb, if you can excite these quantum dots with red to near infrared light, the cells can live longer than uh, what might be ab uh, able to do with just UV excitation. Uh, so what we can infer from these single particle images is that if you track a single particle over time, if it's not bound to anything, or if it has no directionality to its motion, we can look at its displacement over time and calculate the mean square displacement, uh, which is basically how far it travels over a specific amount of time. And uh, we could plot its diffusion over time uh, to determine how these particles behave. If they are purely Brownian in motion, you'll see a linear trajectory of the mean square displacement over time compared to if they can only move in a certain region of a cell. Uh, they'll have this uh, leveling off of the mean square displacement plot. And the point at which it levels off is indicative of the area over which it can diffuse. At the same time, if it experiences directed motion, like on a microtubule track, you will see an increase in the slope of the MSD plot over time. So through our collaborators, we're mostly interested in using this to study signal transduction and in, in the context of chemotaxis. So tumor cells are known to be hypersensitive toward chemokines, which can direct chemotaxis. It's uh, chemokines and growth factors can induce cells in tumors and during development in general to, to mobilize in a certain direction. And they can move along gradients of growth factors that are in the matrix or in solution. And so uh, our collaborators at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine with John Condilis have developed this EGF upshift assay. And it's basically a way to tell in vitro whether or not a cell is hypersensitive toward EGF. So EGF is an epidermal growth factor, and it's implicated in many types of cancers uh, in that if tumor cells are hypersensitive toward EGF, they, in some types of tumors, will have a greater propensity toward metastasis and invasion. Uh, so what we see is that if you starve tumor cells from EGF, basically do not let them be exposed to serum or EGF for two to four hours, then when they are exposed to a stimulus of EGF, they will have a response which is indicative of chemotaxis. And they'll increase their volume very quickly. Uh, it's called the EGF upshift assay. And so on the left, we're imaging in bright field mode. And so you can see in, initially there's uh, the tumor or the tumor cell has a periphery, which the, tum the cell body is roughly right here. Uh, and you can see some of these philopodial structures coming out over time. And at time zero, um, we expose these cells to EGF. And also in the GFP mode, so this is GFP that's just expressed in the cytosol, you can see that the cell periphery expands rapidly. This is over the course of about three and a half minutes. So within one minute of exposure to EGF, they expand rapidly. So what we want to do is 
use quantum dots to understand these pathways. So in these experiments, we can't see where the EGF is binding because it's, this, it's a small protein. But if we attach it to a quantum dot, then we can infer downstream events that happen in the direct vicinity of activation of these receptors. So the pathways that we're interested in looking at are based on uh, the MENA invasive protein. So this is a very complex diagram, but the things you want to draw your attention to are, first of all, the receptor here, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase, EGFR, abdominal growth factor receptor that we're looking at is one of these receptors. And so this dot here would represent EGF, uh, a ligand that binds to this receptor, which activates uh, a, a tyrosine kinase moiety on the internal domain of the receptor. And this uh, integrates with the cytoskeletal machinery through a protein called MENA. MENA is known to uh, stabilize capping proteins for actin. And so capping proteins basically bind to the leading edge of actin uh, to prevent growth. And so at the periphery of cells, actin enables uh, mobilization and chemotaxis of cells uh, by rapid growth of actin tubules from around the periphery of the cells. And capping proteins prevent this. MENA uh, stabilizes capping proteins away from actin. And when MENA is enabled by, uh, by the kinase activity of EGFR, then it will prevent the binding of the capping protein to actin. And in the, in the regions where the uh, receptor is, activating, uh, is activated by the ligand, uh, MENA invasive, or MENA is known to uh, allow growth of actin fibrils in that direction. However, there is an oncogene. MENA is itself a tumor suppressor gene. And under some conditions, it could become um, mutated to be this MENA invasive form, in which it somehow, uh, due to activation by the EGFR receptor, is hypersensitive toward activation of the receptor. And so wherever you have a tumor cell that has mean invasive protein, fewer amounts of ligands are required to activate the pathway. And you'll get uh, much more intensity of impulse uh, response of your ligand causing uh, overgrowth of, of uh, basically philopodial uh, directed chemotaxis of the cell. And so what you can see is that these are fluorescent proteins attached to mena invasive. And when we do the same upshift assay, rather than just looking at cytoplasmic GFP, we see that the mena invasive uh, is associated with these philopodial outgrowths. And so the mena invasive is physically associated with them, but we don't know how it integrates directly into this uh, activation pathway. So what we could do is attach quantum dots to the EGF so we can visualize exactly where this is occurring. And so at a single molecule level, we can see EGF-directed activation of EGFR receptors. And on the left here, this is a video showing a single cell in which quantum dots bound to EGF are binding to the cell. And we could spatially localize where these EGF receptor activation events are and we can infer from the diffusion of these EGF quantum dot conjugates what their level of confinement is, as well as how fast they diffuse. And so we can look on a bulk scale of the entire image itself, the entire cell, and determine how these trajectories correspond to diffusion coefficients of the EGFs and their EGF receptors on a cell. And what we see is that uh, by fitting to a model of simple diffusion in two dimensions, that uh, we can calculate these probability distribution functions, which is basically how far we would expect a, uh, a particle to move over time based on its diffusion coefficient for a certain time increment. And so initially, these quantum dots move uh, with an average diffusion coefficient somewhere between 0.07 to 0.4 centimeter squared, micron squared per second. Uh, and this is basically the distribution of these particles of their diffusion coefficients. Uh, at time over three minutes, this displacement of the particles is uh, much slower. 
and that they have much lower diffusion coefficient. That corresponds to activation of the receptor, uh, perhaps dimerization and internalization of the receptors as well. And so based on these, we can get bulk measurements of how these receptor dynamics change over time. And we could then spatially localize regions in which they're much more activated. And so this is a, a confinement map of EGF, EGFR activation. And so you can see these bright regions correspond to, region, to, correspond to low diffusion coefficients of the, of the particles. And it changes over time. But there are certain regions of the cell where we have less mobility than others. And they can be back calculated to usually correspond to just three to four different uh, diffraction limited spots. And we know from the intensity of these spots, they are not single receptors. They are usually four to five receptors combined into one. And we could then see spatially how these correspond to uh, other types of fluorescent labeled molecules in, in the cell by, by doing dual color imaging with uh, fluorescent proteins. And so in this case, we're looking at uh, the quantum dots. This is, our, this is our raw image of quantum dots of e bound to EGF. We can then use a, an algorithm to extract out all their different uh, localizations. And we can use a diffusion map to determine over time how they, how they move and what regions of the cell are most mobile versus regions which they're least mobile, which would infer activation. We could then have a correspondence between this and uh, mean invasive expression and localization patterns. And this is the point at which we're at right now in that we're still analyzing what correspondence there is between these two different uh, molecular mechanisms of receptive diffusion versus internal actin activation. And so in some regions of the cell, we do see a very strong correspondence, especially along the periphery of the cell. But in the middle of the cell, we do see regions of strong activation of the receptors that do not correspond to uh, actin activation. Uh, so that, I hope, gives you uh, an overview of what you can do with quantum dots at the single molecule level that you could not otherwise do with fluorescent proteins and organic dyes, and that you can't do long-term imaging and uh, get high signal-to-noise dynamics out of fluorescent dyes and proteins in cells, which you can do with nanocrystals such as quantum dots. So the final part of the talk, I'm going to discuss what we've been doing recently with using quantum dots as models for nanoparticle drug delivery in mouse models of tumors. So why do we want to do this? Because uh, basically the nanomedicine market uh, is going to be huge in the next coming decade. Right now it's estimated to be roughly 50 to 60 billion dollars sales per year of nanomedicines. So nanomedicines uh, are really coming in three, class, cl three classes. There are nanomedicines that are pharmaceutics. They are basically drugs that are on the nanometer scale. There are uh, imaging agents, uh, which are basically contrast agents for different types of imaging modalities, molecular imaging modalities that, uh, that are on the nanometer scale. And then there's also bioassays based on nanometer sized particles. Uh, by far, the largest market among these is for nanoparticle based drugs. So these are not just experiments in the lab. These are actually being used clinically. Uh, so as of 2008, more than, tw tw more than 20 nanoparticle drugs have been on the market. And there's at least 30 more in the pipeline. Uh, and these are the, mo the most basic structure is this. You have a nanoparticle in which the core has some kind of drug in it. And these are advantageous compared to conventional drugs, which are small molecules, in that it's, it's twofold. First of all, you have improved solubility. Your solubility of your drug is dependent only on the nanoparticle by itself. You can encapsulate whatever you want inside of it. If it's hydrophobic and it's not normally soluble in water, then you can just tune the solubility by the shell of the nanoparticle itself. At the same time, you can target these particles. So you can potentially have multi-functionality instilled inside of them. And so you have a, uh, a therapeutic element inside the particle, and you could have a surface which can be tuned for solubility, and you could have a specific targeting molecule on the surface, which would enable you to only have uh, uptake of the drug by a specific tissue. Um, however, we actually don't know how this works. There's this 
uh, hypothesis that there's an enhanced permeability and retention effect in tumors in that if you take a nanoparticle compared to a small molecule drug and you inject it into the bloodstream, then a lot of the particles will be uptaken to the tumor and stay there based on their size. And so they can penetrate into the tumor because of the fact that the endothelium of inflamed tissues is more porous than normal tissue. The gap junctions between endothelial cells are on the order of two to three nanometers distance. So if you have a, a particle larger than two to three nanometers, it does not normally diffuse into tissue. But in inflamed tissues such as tumors or wounds, these pores are expanded. Uh, so what we want to do is basically use quantibots as a model for nanoparticle drugs. So what we're basically doing is saying that if we can make a, a nanoparticle drug of a certain size and shape, then we can make a quantum dot with the same hydrodynamic properties, then we can make the assumption that whatever we see the quantum dot doing in an animal will be similar to what a drug conjugate would do. Uh, this is, of course, not be a direct correspondence, but we can use this in a multiplex fashion in order to compare different formulations of drugs to figure out what type of formulation in terms of the size, uh, targeting, and service chemistry would be ideal for delivery of tumors. This cannot be done currently. So if you want to multiplex and compare different, um, different types of nanoparticles in, in an animal, you basically use fluorescent dyes, fluorescent proteins, something that has multiplexing capabilities. But those do not have the capacity to image in near infrared, which is so beneficial for use in animals. So you can see deeply into mouse models, uh, just in the near infrared range alone. You can see at low resolution, uh, up to uh, half a centimeter, some conditions up to a centimeter deep tissue. And so this derives from the fact that uh, this is the effective attenuation of light passing through different types of tissue, whether it's blood, skin, or fat. And there are these specific windows of um, improved penetration depth of tissue. One is in the 800 to 1,000 nanometer wavelength window. This is what's been used most traditionally because of the fact that silicon-based CCDs and PMTs can detect easily in this range. There's also the second window that's now available to us uh, in the 1,000 to 1,400 nanometer range, which has been enabled by new types of uh, photon detectors, which is based on in-gas and uh, mercat elements. So we have a broad spectrum range available to us. And now we can prepare quantum dots that can fit in the spectral range. So we think this is going to open up uh, a new window of comparative analysis between nanoparticle drugs to understand how they function and understand how to make them ideal for many applications. And so this is what I spent a lot of my, uh, my postdoctoral work in the last year doing with John Condila's lab in uh, Aberdeen Psychology Medicine. It's developing and using animal models of tumors in conjunction with multi-photon global imaging for comparative analysis of uh, drug conjugates of nanoparticles. So uh, we want to study how these nanoparticles behave, not just in terms of their pharmacodynamics and biodistribution at the bulk level of whole tissues. We also want to understand at the fundamental level why do nanoparticle drugs get uptaken in tumors and what they do in tumors and what their long-term fate is in the tumor. If you can only target specific cells within the tumor then that would not be advantageous for certain types of drugs. If you're trying to target tumor cells versus macrophages in the tumors, you want to make sure that the subcellular distribution and molecular distribution is, um, is controllable. So we, we take a, an animal with a, with a tumor grown in it. Uh, the most common ones that we use in our lab are uh, memory gland based tumors. Uh, which you grow, uh, attach a window on top of it for long-term imaging, and then this can be directly placed onto a multi-photon microscope, which enables us to image directly into the tumor at a microscopic level. Multi-photon focal microscopy allows much better depth penetration of tissue than conventional microscopy based on a uh, single photon focal because of the fact that you're exciting in the air red. So this is a depth penetration that's cool to see, but you can uh, get decent images at the cellular level um, about 200 to 300 microns deep in the tissue compared to conventional uh, focal microscopy, which is generally about 100 maximum uh, microns in the tissue. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through much of this, but basically the focal microscope has two different excitation bands, one for the uh, greater than 1100 nanometers excitation, one for between 800 to 900 nanometers excitation, 
we have four different lines of emission that we're simultaneously imaging. So we, with four different channels, we can image up to seven colors at the same time based on overlap between two different channels and spectral deconvolution. And so we prepared quantum dots that can be excited and, and can emit light in different wavelength channels than the background channels that we get from fluorescent proteins and background scattering from collagen. So we basically have a five color channel capacity to work with. We have two quantum dot channels in the near infrared and the red. We have GFP expression and CFP expression by certain types of cells in the tumor environment. And we also get a second harmonic uh, scattering band from collagen. So we have molecular contrast from cells of GFP, CFP expression, and we have contrast of collagen. And so basically we have two different types of memory tumors to work with. One is an orthotopic uh, implant into skid mice. Skid mice are immunodeficient, uh, but they do have cells such as macrophages, and, uh, uh, and they do have, under some circumstances, normal tumor microenvironments. Uh, and we also work with spontaneous tumor cells, or, or spontaneous tumors grown in, in transgenic mice, in which we have uh, expression of GFP, well, it's actually Dendra 2, is green, but it's that photoactivatable green fluorescent protein. It's specifically in memory tumors, the two the cells in memory tumors. And we also have CFP expression uh, controlled by a promoter that only ends up having CFP or blue fluorescent emission by uh, macrophage linear cells. So we have a two color uh, correspondence between uh, tumor cells which are green and macrophages which are blue. And so these are the type of experiments that we, of data that we get out. If you just look around in a single tumor, this is within one single tumor of a spontaneous uh, QIMT to, uh, mouse, you'll see there's a huge amount of heterogeneity at the cellular level. And just within several hundred microns away from each other, you might see a region where there's entirely tumor cells and the red is the bloodstream. Whereas in some regions you might have a large amount of fibrous material, collagen is this blue color, and a large amount of macrophage infiltration, which is this cyan color. And so this is, this is really powerful that we can be able to look at the cellular level and see these heterogeneity, which not be able to be observed through normal, um, normal types of imaging at the, the bulk phase. And so we take down two types of experiments. One would be the dynamic type of imaging, which we can see the trafficking of cells, motion of cells, and how the quantum dots in the bloodstream would be dispersed in types of in regions of the tumor. And we could also reconstruct uh, three-dimensional regions of tumors. And so you see in this example that there's a large amount of fibrous material overlying uh, a great number of tumor cells surrounding uh, a bloodstream containing quantum dots. And so this is all in a live animal. And so we can see how nanoparticles actually get trafficked in a tumor. And so we spent about nine months looking at quantum dots in tumors. And if you use orthotopic or skid-based models, you only have contrast based on whatever type of thrust protein you have in the tumor. When we have these transgenic models, we have innate contrast to different types of cells. So we can distinguish tumor cells which are green from macrophages which are blue. And what we see is that when we find regions of tumor cells only, we don't see any extravasation of the quantum bots or mobilization from the bloodstream into the tumor cell. When we find regions with high densities of macrophages, over time you see these, these pulsed bursts of extravasation, and they're temporal. And so if you just look at the tumor over time uh, and average it out, you don't see any great degree of extravasation. But at certain points of time, so this is sped up about uh, tenfold. This is about, a, um, this is about a 20 minute experiment in which you just see diffusion uh, that is initiated at a very specific time point. And this is extravasation of the quantum bots, or just the blood materials in general out of the bloodstream. And we always see this in association with macrophages in the direct vicinity. So the area in which initiates the, uh, the extravasation of nanoparticles out of blood is always either a high density of macrophages in the gym, directly in contact with the bloodstream, or they uh, have uh, or they have 
outgrowths that actually seem to look, that seem to probe directly into the bloodstream. So if you look at this one macrophage here, it has these invaded polio type structures that, uh, that protrude from the cell itself into the bloodstream. So we think at this point macrophages have a large amount to do with extravasation of nanoparticles from the blood and it might be an active process. We are still investigating this and we, at this point, it's just a correlation. It's not a, we do not actually have a great reason to believe that at the molecular level there would be some direct cause of extravasation caused by macrophages, except for the fact that in mammary tumors, we know that macrophages do help to enable intravasation of tumor cells from the tissue interstitium into the bloodstream to enable uh, metastasis of cells from the primary tumor in the memory gland to distal sites such as the lung. So I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. Most of this work was performed, uh, the nanoparticle synthesis work was performed in the knee lab and with three different collaborators who have now left the lab at some point. And all the imaging work for in vivo animal imaging was done in Kandila's lab. These four uh, individuals have a great role in this, especially David Enberg, who developed the microscope, and Allison Harney, who helped with the animal experiments. Uh, these are our funding sources, and I'd be happy to address any questions you have. Is there a way that you foresee um, creating quantum dots with maybe higher quantum yield within that kind of blue region so that you can still have, I guess, that um, small um, bandwidth for emission? Yeah, we can make them with, uh, with really narrow bands and quantum, high quantum yield in the blue range. Uh, it's just that there's so much autofluorescence that great in that range that we don't find it that advantageous. But you can narrow the bands in the infrared. Right, so do you see a way to, I guess, get around the autofluorescence issue, maybe higher quantum yield, would that be the answer? Uh, yeah, you can do that. Another way to do it is by using a lifetime-based analysis. So one thing that's great about quantum dots is they have a long fluorescence lifetime, generally 10 to 20 nanoseconds compared to organic dyes and fluorescent proteins, which are usually around one to two nanoseconds. So if you use gated imaging, which you only detect fluorescence coming off of your sample after five nanoseconds have passed, then you're not seeing the autofluorescence anymore. So, but you also lose a ton of your signal doing that, and it's difficult to um, to develop the apparatuses to and the equipment to do this kind of uh, lifetime-based imaging. But yeah, I think that there is a lot of utility for the blue particles, especially for cellular imaging. Uh, when you don't have a lot of background compared to thick tissue and it's, it's cross-linked, which like in uh, fixed tissue specimens. Uh, so we can prepare those. They're not sold commercially just basically because people wouldn't, there's not a great market for them because of the background issue. Great, last question. Uh, do you think cytotoxicity would be a problem for any cyanide type of quantum Yes. Uh, one thing that's not well known though is that mercury is actually at the molecular level less toxic than cadmium. So in cytotoxicity assays in culture and in comparison to uh, liver toxicity and kidney toxicity in vivo, mercury by, in terms of concentration is less toxic. So we're actually making these quantum dots less toxic by introducing mercury because it's kind of intuitive. But uh, <laughs> the, yeah, we do need to eventually develop completely inert, biologically inert materials. And there are, uh, there's a, an assortment of different materials you could potentially use, uh, which you could replace cadmium with, mercury with. Uh, zinc is one of the materials which is thought to be less toxic and in the base materials. Another question, so you demonstrate beautifully by using a bifunctional or monomer, you can not only decrease the size of quantum, quantum dots, but also you sort of, I think it's like a monovalent decrease size quantum dots. That's really unique. But the one on the left is not only large in size, but also multivalent, star-regulated motifs all around. How can you 
how do you get run away? And so, she went to this project, she went to Chador. She, she's going to be working on this for her, thesis, for her doctoral thesis. So it's not easy. So right now what we can do is basically make a batch of heterogeneous conjugates and separate them out uh, by some kind of separation technique like uh, electrophoresis or chromatography and just pick out a specific band of conjugate ratio. But we do think there are ways to get around that. So a homogeneous solution, you can just conjugate 